Hey guys, welcome back to Total Tactics FPL. It's Fran here, and I'm back with the Gaming 3 Cheat Sheet. Apologies in advance for the audio. Uh, I'm a little bit sick, so uh, don't expect the best from my voice. The video will be long. Of course, Gaming 3, I think, is quite pivotal because some people are considering moving into some assets such as Brighton and Chelsea assets. But I would say the template has actually stayed relatively the same. Uh, potentially, people have changed their minds about Robertson early on. I don't think it's necessarily the need to move away from Robertson, but we'll discuss that once again later on in the video. As far as the midfielders, let's start with the budget midfielders. There has been a little bit of momentum here. Ultimately, De Silva and Reed are new options. I like Reed just because he's a standard 4.5 midfielder who plays 90 minutes a game, uh, playing for a decent team. As far as De Silva, obviously someone who has already gotten two goals, one through a substitute appearance and one through a starting appearance. And even though the underlying data isn't ex ex spectacular, at the end of the day, you're, you're looking at a player who's 4.6, potentially moving into a 4.7 price point who could be quite useful. He also has really good coverage of one of the key fixtures, which is game week four. So let's say if you look at assets like Nico William or even some of the Fulham players, they do have a pretty bad fixture on that week, whereas De Silva has a pretty decent fixture um, for the weeks ahead. So if you need a coverage of that fixture and you're looking to actually start him, then then totally fine, fair enough, go for someone like De Silva. Um, he does occupy a little bit more money, so moving into him now does seem a little bit odd, but it's up to you whether you actually think the upside of De Silva is there in that he could be a starter for your team. Bailey has dropped, unfortunately, to a complete avoid. And he might actually start next week. He might even score versus Crystal Palace, but I don't really see the value of going for Bailey for now, especially when we see that Gerrard is so prone to tactically rotating the team and Bailey doesn't really fit when he plays the diamond. So that's kind of my issue there uh, with Bailey, unfortunately. If we move on to the 5.0 to 5.9 price bracket, this is an interesting one because there are clearly no best options. And my general opinion is that some of the assets here will probably end up faring better than most. I actually really like Eze and Gross as options more than options like Aronson, Dewsbury Hall and Gray slash Gordon. And you can see Neto and Pedence have dropped, even Almiron have dropped. Almiron has dropped due to fixtures, Neto and, and Pedence. I would actually say Pedence has looked interesting, um, a little bit more so than Neto. And when you look at the underlying data, it does back that up. But Wolves haven't really been mustering many chances themselves. So there isn't really a point, I would say, in distinguishing both Pedence and Neto. For Gray and Gordon, I just ultimately think Everton are one of the worst teams in the league. And yes, whilst they might get some returns for some weaker teams, obviously New, um, Nottingham Forest is a team that we expect them to get a decent result versus um, as the Everton team. I just don't really see the value in going for Gray slash Gordon. I much prefer, unfortunately, at this price point, what you can get in the mid uh, in the defensive positions at a 4.5 or even at a 5.0. We have assets like Cucurella in the game, even Doherty, some Spurs fullbacks. You have some 4.5 central defenders from Brighton, from Arsenal. There really just isn't a reason to tap into this price back bracket. And I, I feel like even though Gross is interesting, as you can see, Gross is someone who rose this week, and he 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 did once again get into interesting attacking positions in Newcastle. So it clearly wasn't just a pure one-off first United. But I just don't really see Gross being a consistent option, someone you actually want to actually spend money in your team with, compared to assets like the defenders that we'll be talking about later. I do actually really like Eze as an option. He is someone who two years ago, before he had a catastrophic injury, did light the league alight. I, I would say he was a bright spark in the Roy Hodgson team. And under Vieira, we know he's been able to actually work with very technical midfielders, as well as very physical midfielders such as Gallagher. As far as Eze, he's looked exceptional in the preseason. I don't know if you saw his fantastic touch and his kind of um, great dribbles in the preseason or even his assist versus Liverpool, but he clearly has the quality to be an interesting differential. It really just comes down to whether you actually like playing Eze in these fixtures. There's a Man City fixture, which is quite tough. But ultimately, I, as I said, I still prefer the defenders overall, which is why I'm, I'm tentative over moving someone like Eze into a best option. I just don't really think there's a viable one in this price bracket. As far as the 6.0 to 6.9 midfielders, we have Martin and Rodrigo, both as top options. Martin it clearly is one of the best options in the game, and I think he will be template for all playing managers um, by this week. We can see multiple price rises has suggested a lot of managers have moved into him. Some managers have even moved Saka into him. And I understand that from the point of view where you'd like to upgrade in other positions, but I, I, I do think Saka is obviously equally great as a pick. It's just that Martinelli is so underpriced that he has that sort of value. For me, Martinelli is so interesting because he's got a 90 minutes back to back. The Smith Rowe sub actually came on for Saka. So you can already see system wise, as I mentioned, uh, in my previous kind of pre um, review video in Game Week 2, that Zinchenko has also changed a little bit how Martinelli plays, along with how Ben White is operating at the right back position. So those things could change once again 
once Tomiyasu maybe joins back into the team, potentially gets some starting minutes and steals those away from Ben White. And, and that's kind of how things stand. But I really don't see the point of moving on Martinelli. He's definitely not a question mark for my team at this point in time. And really enjoying having him in my team. As far as Rodrigo, he's an option that I would like to actually move into as soon as possible. Yes, there's going to be a tough Chelsea fixture. He is projected actually by a lot of FPL models to do well versus Chelsea. I actually wonder why that is. I know Leeds are playing at home and potentially people factor that in as to Leeds actually being more impressive when it comes to goal scoring. But Rodrigo is going to be extremely interesting for two reasons. Bamford seemingly has an injury. And even though he might actually be able to be selected for the Chelsea game, it seems like his injury is not as bad as we expected. I do expect this Leeds team to rest Bamford because last season he was brought back too early and ultimately pretty much spent the season uh, in the stands because of his inability to kind of recuperate with his injury and also his inability to get match fit. So he was kind of eased in too quickly and I think Rodrigo will therefore be taking a lot more minutes. And what we saw in the previous game with Bamford being injured was Rodrigo getting 90 minutes. And I can see that for the next few fixtures that that could really generally be a possibility, especially since Leeds will have to have and play midweek games just like the rest of the league because of the World Cup schedule and how that's kind of uh, fast forwarded things. So Rodrigo definitely seems like a top option for now, even though the next uh, fixture is Chelsea. I would even move into him just to kind of capitalize on maybe price rises and also the fact that he's probably one of the most interesting options at this price point. Um, as far as Trossard, he's someone who's fallen down because there are other interesting options from Brighton. Namely, the defenders such as Dunk or even a keeper like Sanchez or someone like in the midfield like Gross. And the Estupinian transfer will also impact his role in the team. We have to anticipate how Trossard's position will change and evolve with Estupinian coming in. And I would like to see a little bit more from Trossard first in a different position, potentially with uh, Purvis coming into the team and understanding what that means for him before I would like to move into Trossard. So tentatively, he's actually still you know, a second tier option, but potentially even a third tier option, depending on how his role changes going forwards. As far as Odegaard and Guedes, the reason why they're there is, is simply because Odegaard, in my opinion, is still playing for a team that has unfortunately been underpriced. I think Arsenal assets collectively have been underpriced and therefore Odegaard is an interesting option. But realistically, when we see options like Martinelli, when we see the defenders at such great price points, he just doesn't really make sense. And that's kind of how we have to contextualize the assets in FPL. You're only going to get three Arsenal assets and he doesn't really make too much sense. Guedes is an interesting transfer from Wolves. He really hasn't set La Liga light. He was previously a young stud, kind of up upcoming player from Paris two or three years ago, but he really hasn't lived up to his promise. And I'm, I'm interested to see how Matthias Nunes and his transfer Im impacts his Wolves team and maybe Guedes finds some form there. But for now, tentatively, he's going to be an option that's close to an avoid, whereas Rashford and Lingard are the two of voids in this price bracket. Lingard mostly just because the, the fixtures aren't particularly great and then Rashford because United continue to look worse and worse week on week and ultimately they've got Liverpool next week with Arsenal very very close uh, in the distant future. So that's that's the situation with the midfielders. If we move into the premium bracket of midfielders you can see Zaha is clearly an option that has risen and Gundogan as well as someone who's risen as well. Bernardo Silva doesn't seem like he's going to be leaving to Barcelona but it seems like Gundogan has retained or regained the the trust of Pep and I can see this being one of those seasons where he becomes essential to the team plays very very key minutes in the team I just would say he's clearly below Zaha because he's not going to get those expected minutes you saw something like the Foden uh, substitution at 45 minutes in the previous game week and, and that just really isn't a, a positive sign for someone who wants to move into a Man City midfielder and it's always going to be the question we ask ourselves when we move into an asset like Gundogan he's at 7.5 so he does offer you a little bit of a cut rate price compared to some of the 8.0 midfielders and that could be interesting. I can see him clearly f moving quite freely in the system. He's he's allowed to make these late runs and he's con continuously doing them. So that's really positive. Uh, but his minutes are still the question mark. And I think he's unfortunately just going to sit at that second tier for now, whereas Zaha is clearly a top option. I mentioned Zaha and his ability to actually be a top asset this year. He's really, really well priced. And I think Vieira has once again done an incredible job with this Crystal Palace team and Zaha simply is the focal point. He's also going to get penalties too so in some weeks where he might not have a uh, spectacular performance you could also get penalties there. Some guaranteed points that you would get over the course of the season. Not only that but he's a lot cheaper at 7.0 compared to some of the 8.0 mids. Only has one tough fixture in game week four and we've seen already Zaha being been threatening versus two very, very top teams in Liverpool and Arsenal so that's the positive sign. Ultimately going into Zaha early might be a bit of a hidden gem pick right? We, we talked about how Eze an interesting option equally Zaha is as well as the 
primary kind of talisman of Crystal Palace. As far as Sancho and Grealish, both avoids. Sancho has been dropped into an avoid similar to the way Rashford has been. Just comes down to his price point and the fact that United have been so dire. As far as 8.0 um, plus options, we've got Saka and Diaz still staying at the top. I actually have kept this list relatively the same. Foden had the most electric week out of all midfielders, but ultimately with came out of that with nine points only and that's going to be a huge detriment to Foden owners I feel like they were really hard done by that could have been at least 13 points uh in the previous week and that's pretty much the only thing going against Foden whereas you have with Kuduszewski similar questions and I would say with Mount Madison Madison has slightly worse fixtures and Mount unfortunately just hasn't been lighting the league light so I feel like a lot of managers kind of projected to move Diaz into someone like Mount in game week three but that's no longer on the cards because Mount has been quiet and Diaz also his situation has changed because of the Darwin red card and for me, that maintains Diaz's status as a top option. And Saka, simply because the fixtures are so good uh, for the next three weeks back to back. And even the United fixture, because recently Arsenal have actually been tra traditionally doing well versus United. They're still pretty far away from some top transfer options that they're going for. It doesn't seem like those deals will be closed. Um, maybe it will by then, but we'll see what happens there. I, I think for now, Arsenal have fantastic fixtures and, and therefore Saka still has to maintain his status as a top option. As far as Bowen, he's got weird fixtures as well. So definitely he's going to drop because he hasn't uh, shown me enough, especially with this West Ham team who have looked pretty poor themselves, um, that he's not going to be worth that 0 0.5 plus any of the 8.0 midfielders for now. And with Mares, just a complete avoid, even though he started in game week two, uh, I just see much more quality from Foden and Gundogan, to be honest. As far as 10 plus players, De Bruyne has moved up all the way to the top next to Salah. I know a lot of people are tentatively saying that Salah is going to be an option that we move on from this season, but I feel like that's very, very recency bias from game week two. I don't see myself as an owner of Salah really thinking about transferring him out. He's such a great option. The fixtures are still perfect on paper. The United fixture is one where I'm strongly considering captaining him and things haven't changed since then i just think this liverpool team have started off a little bit weak um but they're playing potentially one of the top or bottom five teams in the league unfortunately with united and it's a fixture that salah really really benefits from because i would say sean Maguire always struggle with um dealing with salah and the interplay with trent on that right hand side so that's going to be interesting and unfortunately sun and sterling haven't moved sun actually seems to be a worse option even though sterling is the more i would say vibey pick i suppose he, he he's looked a lot better on grass but ultimately the returns for both have been very limited we've talked about chelsea multiple uh, multiple times in terms of how ineffective they are at actually creating uh attacking opportunities for anyone other than their defenders as far as sun he just hasn't started the season off hot and that's pretty much what it comes down to Moving into the forwards, I feel like this is another position that hasn't moved significantly too much. Mitrovic, I've actually kept still as a top option. The reason why I've done that is because I still think he is arguably underpriced as an asset, and we still see that he's getting consistent chances. Okay, yes, he missed a penalty, but it doesn't actually mean he's a bad option on paper. He's still going to be on penalties, in my opinion. He's still going to be a key option that Fulham actually are able to create chances off of. And maybe whilst you won't want to get Mitrovic right now in your team, it makes more sense to go for him around a game week eight horizon and think about wildcarding into him he's still going to be a top option in my opinion by then uh and, and he still is now as far as options like awani he's actually been included in the cheat sheet i think he's the preferred option over johnson but nottingham forest fixtures are still rough so i would still class him in the tier below and boom and welbeck have moved up i just don't really like going for and boom and welbeck we mentioned that welbeck is someone who is pivotal to this brighton team and he does a lot of dirty work that i would say is underrated but that doesn't give you any points in fpl and that's pretty much the problem with welbeck and it will continue to be the problem with him i think he will get returns but he's not the focal point of the team whatsoever when it comes to the actual finishing touch and therefore welbeck isn't the top option in fpl as far as and Bumo, he is someone who's clearly a secondary or even tertiary option at times for Brentford. I just see Tony as a much better asset. Yes, and Bumo was someone who got some interesting points last season, but you also have to factor in the fact that he's moved into the forward position, so he's losing the clean sheet points, and also the mo the bulk of his points were actually when he took penalties for this team, uh, which Tony will be taking for the time being unless he's injured again. So, and Bumo doesn't really make sense unless Tony's injured, in my opinion. Uh, if we move on to Solanke, he's just someone who's dropped because... He hasn't been lighting things alight. The Bournemouth fixtures are still very, very tough. Maybe we can consider consider him later in the season because of Bournemouth's fixtures easing up and maybe him showing a little bit more presence in the league and actually getting involved, growing some confidence there. But for now, just not an option that I would really like to think about. Uh, Tony and Wilson, Watkins, Bamford, these are all options that I don't think are super interesting ultimately outside of Tony. Tony is by far and above one of the options I'd love to think about if I was wildcarding now. I think 
if you're wildcarding as an FPL manager, you definitely want to think about going for someone in the 7.0 price bracket, whether that's Zaha in the midfield position or whether that's Tony in the forward position. These are players who are very interesting because they are the talisman of the teams. They are on penalties. They are actually very, very uh, well priced, in my opinion, considering the fixtures that they have and how lethal they can be on any individual game. And that's pretty much what it comes down to, whereas players like Wilson, Watkins and Bamford all have tough fixtures or injury conditions like Bamford um, or I don't rate them like Watkins. As far as Jesus and Havertz, nothing's changed there. I've actually moved Havertz tentatively up. There's no reason to move away from Jesus. Jesus is clearly a god tier option in the game. I don't think that's even a question. But if you would like to go for a third forward, I don't think it's a crazy shout to go for Havertz. Um, he has some really, really good fixtures on paper. But does it really make sense when you have an option like Tony? Not really. So that's kind of why I've priced Havertz in a, a tier just above a void because I don't think he's a abhorrent option for now. As far as Vardy, I've had to drop him just because there's just no value pushing up into someone like Vardy. He costs too much money. He definitely breaks your team structure for absolutely nothing. You could just go for James Madison, someone who actually probably is very useful because he's at that sort of template 8.0 price point that you can manipulate and move around between several players. And that's kind of the value of someone like a Madison over a Vardy for now especially when you consider the fact that Madison can get some clean sheet points uh, and also has simply just been Leicester's best player for a long time now. As far as Darwin, that red card has completely changed things in FPL. I think it's actually made the template even more template. I know people are annoyed with the term template, but that's just simply what it is. Uh, Darwin being transferred out probably means that a lot of managers will either be thinking about going to Tony or moving into a 4-4-2 structure or even a 5-3-2 structure for now. And that's kind of how things have changed in FPL, just simply because Darwin got that red card, which is so impactful because it's a three-match ban. As far as Haaland and Kane, I've moved Kane up into a top option. I actually think he's probably the second best captaincy option this week. If you want to go differential, if you want to go for a sword attacking pick, you're, you're bored of going for Salah. Definitely Kane for me is the second best captaincy option in the game for game week three. Holland is just so interesting because I don't see the the re real reason or utility of moving away from him when City um City have such great fixtures. Even though Newcastle is projected to be one of the tougher fixtures on paper, they still absolutely destroyed Newcastle at St James Park last season at the back end. Um, so I I can see Holland being a, a key part of the troubles there for Newcastle this coming weekend. So that's how I see things. I still think Holland's a great option and Kane as I said is always going to be pivoting back and forth in my opinion for now uh, unless let's say Holland suddenly drops a lot in terms of his minutes earned or gets an injury so these are how things are with the premium forwards and that's how things are for the forwards moving on to the defenders we have a long lengthy list of defenders here at the 4.0 price point I've made Patterson uh, tentatively the same as Nico Williams Nico Williams has some pretty weak I would say fixtures going forwards if people wanted to move out of Robertson for some reason i guess moving to patterson or nico williams is pretty much the same if you actually envision playing them or putting them as first on your bench for the next few weeks don't really see that possibility um to be honest in terms of moving out of robertson but as far as these two op players being 4.0 options i still prefer nico williams a little bit more but patterson is someone who's also nailed on this everton team and has potentially better fixtures so that's pretty much what it comes down to they're still going to be best options just by default because they're 4.0 players who play effectively 90 minutes a game as far as uh 4.0 to 4.9 players Saliba is still I would say the the top option here I've actually taken Ben White off of this list because I do think that the person to lose minutes out of Saliba and White is going to be White I think Tommy Asu will actually come in and play right back for quite a few minutes and continue to take them away from Ben White's minutes whereas Saliba for me is the better central defender um yes he scored an own goal but really, who cares? If you watch that own goal back, if you have been watching the games at all, you know Saliba is a top option. There's no reason to actually take him off as a centre-back. It's not just because he's scored an own goal. Gabriel's made plenty of mistakes as an Arsenal central defender, but he's managed to keep his position in the team for obvious reasons. He's a very, very strong aerial threat as well, and someone who does command his box and area very well. So that's the same kind of thing I would say about Saliba, maybe not necessarily aerially, but just in terms of his dexterity, his agility as a player, how calm he is on the ball. I really think Arteta does value that um, from a defender. As far as Brentford defenders and Dunk, these are options that I've added into the list in terms of keeping them as ones to think about for sure. Ultimately, if you have someone like Ramsey on your team, you probably already have triple arsenal. So therefore, the next best options are going to be Brentford and Brighton defenders who actually have really, really good fixtures. Um, Estupinian obviously is, is a new option in FPL. I didn't actually count him at the time. We also need to wait for minutes to be established before we even think about it moving Purvis into the cheat sheet so that's kind of how things stand dunk is the safer more interesting transfer for now um no reason to play with risk and you want to have a playing 4.5 defender because they have so much value this year as far as Sessegnon 
unfortunately the antonio conte quotes aren't super positive um for over Perisic, but I don't think it means Sessegnon is a definite lock. I think there's going to be a lot of rotation in the midweek fixtures. Perisic has definitely been included into this team to grow some of the prospects such as Sessegnon and also Destiny, um, who's joined the team. And, and those are going to impact the minutes of Sessegnon ultimately. I think he's just a, a little bit of a tentative, weird option because if he was, let's say, con playing consistent minutes for Spurs and, and, and starting week in, week out, he'd be a top option. Um, it wouldn't even be questioned, but just... The off chance of getting zero points, one point, it, I just don't really see the value of going for Session for now. He is very juicy. If you feel like you can get the transfer news right this week, especially since Spurs have the early fixture and you want to take that upside, maybe it makes sense. But for me, for now, it's not an option. Johnny and Dallow have both fallen. I, I just think Wolves, especially with the change in their tactical style and also United just continue to be so poor. These are both not options that I'd like to think about. I know I only is the one who passes the eye test a little bit more at Wolves, but his defensive performances have also, I think, called into question whether he really makes too much sense as an asset. I think at 4.5, you're probably looking more for, for clean sheets first and then attacking returns second, um, as well as minutes before at, at, attacking returns, to be honest. And so that's why I don't really rate I Nuri as an option. As far as the 5.0 to 5.5 players, it's actually very, very similar. Walker is someone who's moved up into the sheet. Um, Cucurella has moved to the top of the list as well. Cucurella is actually someone who's clearly on my transfer target list, but I don't think I'll move into him necessarily this week because I do value the strength of saving a transfer and actually just judging a little bit more on that Leeds game, whether I'd like to go into Cucurella. I'd like to see whether he plays left center back, potentially uh, how that changes when Chilwell comes into the team, whether he's going to continue playing left wing back because it seems like he has Tuchel's trust and, and so on and so forth. So I might be missing out on a little bit of short term upside, but not going for Cucurella now. Uh, but I just don't see the value of taking a hit for Cucurella myself. I, I think he's a fantastic option for any manager to think about downgrading from someone like Robertson if you must. Uh, at the same time, a great transfer away from someone like Trippier, who's conversely dropped in the cheat sheet. So you have an option like Walker as well, and Gabriel Zinchenko still top options too. I think these are clearly the best players. They have the minutes. They're they're pretty much nailed, I would say. And I'm not worried about them being top options. I really think this is the year to go five at the back. Uh, and I don't think anything has changed from the template. Ultimately, if you have a spot and you've saved it for an 8.0 mid, you can still fit that in with the five defender structure if you move away from Robertson, for example, which a lot of managers are doing this week or even wildcarding out of. So that that is an opportunity there that you can play around. Ake is someone who's just in the tier below. I don't really know uh, what the horizon is for Laporte to come back into this team. Ultimately, I think Ake is someone who, if he makes a mistake, is probably closer to getting knocked off the starting rotation compared to someone like Walker. So I really feel like Walker is the better option for now, even though Ake does get significantly better attacking returns, I would say, just on paper. Uh, Perisic and Dyer, Romero, Dorothy Emerson, these are all the Spurs defenders that we can be thinking about at these price points. And Romero has an injury, so obviously there should be an asterisk there. Do keep that in mind. But it seems like that's going to affect, first of all, Spurs and their ability to get clean sheets because I would say he's their best central defender. As far as the actual fullbacks, though, we know that they're still going to get attacking returns no matter what. They're quite different from the rest of the league where I would say you have to prioritize cheat sheet, I'm um, sorry, clean sheets first. But the Spurs defenders actually are so involved in attack that I would say they are the one team that probably bends this rule slightly. Uh, ultimately, those Spurs under Conte got a lot of clean sheets last season. I really do think that will actually maintain uh, its course as long as Romero gets fit sometime soon. So that's going to be quite a big impact, I think, in terms of clean sheets for Spurs. So definitely watch out for that. I would say if you want to gamble on a Spurs defender, definitely just wait for the early fixture news. Don't move into Spurs defenders now. Wait until as close as possible to the start of the fixture um, for game week three to actually make your moves for a Spurs defender. The issue, once again, as I say, is the midweek rotation. Very, very sh soon you'll have to deal with that rotation. And unless you want to play with that upside and you have enough safety in, in your bench or you feel like you can mastermind Conte starting 11 every week, uh, I just think it's a little bit of a tentative avoid for me. Trippier is someone who falls in the list. I know a lot of people have been talking about keeping Trippier on the bench and then rotating with someone like Nico Williams. I don't really see the value in that. I don't think it makes sense. I think you want to move into Sonic Cucurella as soon as possible or even Walker if you can. Uh, and the same goes for Dean and Cash, who are not interesting options whatsoever. As far as 5.5 plus options, nothing has really changed here. Chilwell and Matip have just fallen priority. You could even see Fofana join this Chelsea team, so that could change things like, let's say, Cucurella's value. Uh, James, for me, is still a top option just because he's such a clinical finisher. He provides something that most fullbacks don't in this league in terms of actually being a finishing threat. As far as his crosses as well, I don't know if you saw his cross in Game 2, but it was splendid. Uh, once again, just showing that Chelsea does lack a central threat, to be honest. Um, but he's a fantastic option, one that I would not take my team 
um, or take out of my team. Ultimately, Cucurella is going to be a double up with, of Chelsea defense uh, and much more interesting than Mendy potentially, but we'll see how things go from that point of view. Last but not least, we have the goalkeepers. This is another position where nothing much has changed. I've added Henderson into the cheat sheet and dropped Meslier. Ultimately, as I said, I've not been impressed by the Leeds defense, and I really think there is no reason to rate them whatsoever. Yes, Meslier looks like a standout keeper. He makes fantastic saves week on week, but the chances that he's facing are just too much, too numerous, and I just don't see the value of going for an FPL keeper unless you're banking that every week he's going to get fantastic save points and bonus points uh, galore because I don't really see the clean sheet ever coming for Leeds, if I'm being honest. Maybe they'll get it versus Chelsea now that I've said it. Uh, but Henderson had a fantastic performance on the weekend as well, so he's definitely someone who's been included into the cheat sheet. Obviously, a bit of a tentative option. I wouldn't necessarily move him to a top option for now because I think Sanchez has really, really good fixtures and ultimately plays for a better defense. New uh, Nottingham Forest actually did come to a lot of opportunities, including a penalty so uh that's sort of what I'm, I'm i'm valuating against let's say a team like brighton who actually are are a very very uh, formidable defense and probably are more nailed to get clean sheets uh consistently unless you know dean henderson has fantastic performances week on week and has basically you know um a player of the season season and that's pretty much what the cheat sheet is like for game week three i hope you guys enjoyed the video and i'll see you guys next for the team selection